use of secondary antibodies. Why? Savings and sensitivity. Basically, by using a labeled secondary antibody that binds to a primary antibody that binds to the thing we're really interested in, we can get a signal amplification, so we get a stronger signal, and we can save money because it's gonna be a lot cheaper than trying to get your primary antibody, the one that binds the thing of interest, to be conjugated. So let me explain. We have to use antibodies in the lab as probes, so basically molecules that are going to allow us to detect the presence of specific other molecules. These other molecules are often proteins, such as in the case of a Western blot, or they can also be proteins or other molecules in blood, such as from the presence of a virus. So if a virus is in you and it makes a certain protein, then a test called an ELISA, for example, can then use antibodies to detect for that specific protein in the blood. And so these techniques rely on the fact that antibodies can be made that can target, um, and when I say target, I just mean they bind specifically, to various proteins and things. And so we're often thinking about it in the context of our bodies and our immune system. But basically, animals can be immunized with a protein that you want them to make antibodies against, or you can, um, there are now more genetic manipulation type tools that you can use to actually uh, make these in the lab without the use of animals. But these antibodies basically can be made that will then recognize and bind to specific proteins of interest. And this is going to allow us in the lab to use those antibodies in order to specifically bind to a protein of interest or a modification of interest. It doesn't have to be a protein, but it often is. So we can have these antibodies that are going to bind specifically to a thing that we're looking for. And we call these original antibodies the primary antibodies. So the primary antibodies are going to specifically bind to the thing that you're looking for, but they're going to be invisible. Um, and so these antibodies, we can't detect them. And so we need a way to detect them. We can make molecules like antibodies detectable by attaching some sort of um, tag on it. So when the common word, like term that we use when we're talking about something that's like permanently attached is conjugated. So we can basically conjugate that antibody to something that we can detect. This can be a fluorophore, so something that is fluorescent. It's going to give off light. If you shine light at one wavelength at it, it'll give off light at a different wavelength. Or we can use something that's like an enzyme. And so an enzyme is a reaction helper or a speeder upper. And so we can basically use an enzyme that what it does is it when we add a chemical, even an invisible chemical, it kind of makes the reaction happen. That's going to turn that chemical either colored in the case of a colorimetric readout or make it give off light in the case of a chemiluminescent readout. So um, chemiluminescence is just when something gives off light and chemiluminescence is when the excitation energy that makes the molecules give off that light comes from a chemical reaction. So we often attach or conjugate these antibodies to HRP, which is um, horseradish peroxidase, which is basically going to allow us to convert invisible molecules into things that we can see and then we can measure them. And then this way, we're going to be able to detect how much of a thing is present. But we typically don't stick that label onto that primary antibody. So the primary antibody, remember, that's the one that's going to directly bind to your thing of interest. And so you might think, okay, well, why don't we just label that primary antibody? If we did that, that would be called direct detection. And that can be done, and that's often done with um, kind of like housekeeping proteins. So basically, if you're running a Western blot set, you want to make sure that you have equal amounts of um, your different samples loaded in the different lanes if you're trying to compare between conditions so that you don't say have think you have way more of a protein in one lane than in another. So you think you have a one, way more of a protein in one sample than another, when really you have just loaded more of one of the samples. And so you often do another probe for a housekeeping protein. So something that's expressed to similar levels in all of the cells. And these housekeeping proteins are commonly chosen to be things that have a high level of expression. And if they have a high level of expression, well, then you don't need to worry too much about the, the detection being really sensitive. And so it makes sense that you could label your primary antibody, which brings us to one of the points about secondary antibody use 
And so in secondary antibody use, you have a secondary antibody that's going to bind to the primary antibody. And it's actually the secondary antibody that's going to be labeled. And in this way, you're going to get a couple of benefits. You're going to get signal in, you're going to get signal amplification. So basically you can have multiple secondary antibodies binding to that same primary antibody. And this is going to then allow you to have an increase in signal. Whereas if you just compared to when, if you just had that single label on that single primary. So if you had a, a primary that was labeled and bound to your thing of interest, you would have that say one label per molecule that you bound. But now, or molecule presence that you were looking for. But if you have a secondary antibody that's labeled, well, now you can have multiple secondary antibodies per primary antibody. And this is then going to allow you to have a higher amount of signal. You can also, I say, um, have a higher signal if you use like a polyclonal antibody for your primary antibody, which basically means that polyclonal antibodies are going to recognize multiple sites on that same on that same original target. And so this is going to then allow you to have multiple antibodies bound to that original thing. And that will allow for signal amplification too, though it also puts you at more risk for, um, for a higher background. But going back to the idea of the secondary antibodies. So the secondary antibodies are going to allow us for that signal amplification. And in the case of having a primary antibody that's conjugated, well, you would have less of a, you wouldn't have the amplification, and so you would have a weaker signal. That's why you only want to use it if your primary antibody, um, the thing your primary antibody is detecting is something that is expressed really, really well. If your thing isn't expressed that well, so there's not that much of it, you're going to need your method to be more sensitive. And so in this way, the secondary antibody can give you help. Another reason we don't just use direct detection, so we don't just conjugate that primary antibody, is cost. Basically, if lots of people are going, everybody, well, not everybody, but there's most people are going to be looking for different proteins. And so there's going to be a lot, a lot, a lot of primary antibodies that are needed, a lot of different ones, I must say. Actually, making these antibodies can be really, really expensive, involve the use of animals, um, things like this, that makes it really expensive for companies to make these and therefore really expensive for them to sell them. And so the primary antibodies are usually really expensive on their own. And now imagine that you want to add the extra cost to label those antibodies. Well, now you're going to have an even more expensive primary antibody. And that's not cost effective because each of those primary antibodies, you can only use it to detect that one thing. Whereas a secondary antibody, you're going to be able to use that to detect lots and lots of different primary antibodies. Basically, your secondary antibody is going to recognize kind of like the generic part of the primary antibody. So if you look at the anatomy of an antibody, basically it has these constant regions and these variable regions. The constant region is going to be kind of like generic for the animal that makes it. And so humans will have one type of constant region and a mouse will have another type of constant region and a rabbit will have another type of constant region. Um, and then each of these will have each antibody within that within that animal will have different variable regions. And so the variable region is the part that actually is going to bind to um, the thing of interest. So we have this generic part and this unique part. And so the generic part your constant region and the, the unique part to your variable region. But the constant region is only constant for a specific um, species. So say you have a primary antibody and we have a primary antibody that was made from a rabbit. Um, and so this rabbit will have a generic, this rabbit antibody will have a generic rabbit antibody part and a specific part that's specific for the protein. And so this is going to bind to the protein that it recognizes. Now your secondary antibody, its unique part, so the part that recognizes the uh, something of interest, it's been raised so that it recognizes, it binds to the generic part of the first antibody of the primary antibody. So your secondary antibody in this case would be an anti-rabbit. And then the, it would be made in a different animal though. So it wouldn't be made in a rabbit because the rabbit would then be like, wait, this is my own antibody. The antibody from the rabbit would then recognize just the generic part of the rabbit and say, this is me. So in the secondary antibody, you have it that's made from a different animal. And basically, so you would have something like a goat antibody and the goat antibody, 
um, would then have a generic goat part and a unique part that's going to recognize the rabbit. So it would be anti-rabbit. And then the secondary antibody would be attached to something detectable. And so we'd be able to then either use a fluorescence, so we shine light and it gives off light, or we add some sort of chemical and it converts that chemical into something that we can see. And so in this way, we're able to take advantage of this dual strategy in order to detect the primary antibody. And the secondary antibody, remember, it's just binding the generic part of the primary antibody. And it turns out that there are only a few different species that are commonly used to make those primary antibodies. In the case of the polyclonal antibodies, so this is where we have a variety of different antibodies. So they're binding to different parts of the protein as opposed to a monoclonal antibody where it's just a one, one antibody. Um, so it's recognizing one spot on the protein rather than different antibodies that recognize different spots on the protein. And I know I'm using the word protein, um, but it can also be something other than a protein. It's just the thing that's being recognized. And so a monoclonal, you're only going to have a single antibody in that mixture. And a polyclonal, you're going to have multiple antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies are harder to make. Um, they're often made in mice, um, and there's various genetic manipulation tools that have been are being used in order to kind of like make them without animals even. But commonly, if you're thinking of a monoclonal antibody, that's often made in a mouse. And for polyclonal antibodies, they're typically made in large animals because this is how you can get kind of the most bang for your buck because basically they're going to purify these antibodies out from the animals that they've immunized. And so you're going to see things like goat and rabbit when you're talking about a polyclonal antibody. So basically you have goat, you have rabbit, you have mouse. Um, you only have a few species that are commonly used to make these primary antibodies. And therefore you only need a, a small set of secondary antibodies because they just have to recognize that primary antibody. And so there's just a few of these secondary antibodies that are needed. And so it and they can be used with all these different primary antibodies and so companies know, like, we're going to need to sell a lot of these. We have a lot of interest in this. We can just make them kind of like in bulk and we can sell them more cheaply. Then if we had to kind of pay the charge customers the price of, if we only had one customer that wanted a conjugated primary antibody, it doesn't make cost sense for us to make a bunch of it. But if we have a bunch of people that are going to want the same antibody, we can make them, we can, we can sell them really cheaply because we're going to be selling a lot of them. So it's going to be a lot cheaper to buy these secondary antibodies conjugated than it is to buy the primary antibodies conjugated. And so in this way, we can still, we still have to pay a lot for those primary antibodies, but we don't have to pay that much for the secondary antibodies. And we can get the same secondary antibodies that we can use with all sorts of different primary antibodies. We can, basically there's lots of different options for these secondary antibodies as well. So we have things like, do we want the, do we want to use a fluorophore? So that's gonna be where we shine light at one wavelength and give off light of another wavelength. And we can use different um, wavelengths of fluorophore in order to um, do various things if we want to detect various wavelengths. Um, we can also, if we want to use an enzyme conjugated um, antibody, such as HRP, I've recently slipped, like become a big fan of the HRP. It's going to give you higher sensitivity, basically because you have an enzyme. So you're basically continuously generating signal and you're amplifying it to high levels. So you're going to get higher detection that sensitivity than you would with just a fluorescent label. There are different types of readouts you can use for this enzyme linked. Um, this could be like a colorimetric readout. Um, so like OPD is common with this or a chemiluminescent readout such as um, with luminol where you're going to be seeing light. And basically this is going to be very, very, um, very, very sensitive and helpful. So you have a lot of different options that you can choose from. And if you're using primary antibodies that were made from different species, you can actually do probing for multiple different things in the same, in the same blot, in the same step with your secondary antibodies. It's important though that you want to wash your membrane or wash your ELISA plate or whatever in between the primary antibodies and the secondary antibodies so that you don't get a high level of background. You want the secondary antibodies just binding to the primary antibodies 
um, that are present on, in your sample. And so you also want to wash it well afterwards so that you can wash off any of the antibodies, secondary antibodies that are kind of just floating around there because you want to have as crisp a, of bands as possible. You only want to see the present, see a band if there's actually something protein present, or you only want to see light in, in the well if there's, only, if there's something present. So to review, a primate antibody is going to recognize the thing that you're interested in and bind to it, but it's not going to show you it. To show you it, we typically add a secondary antibody. The secondary antibody is going to be specific for, it's going to bind to that primary antibody, and it's going to be labeled to something. And this label is going to make it so that we can detect the presence of the primary antibody. It's either going to give off light, it's going to turn a color, things like this. So it's going to allow for detection of your thing. This detection is called indirect detection because we're not detecting the thing directly. We're detecting it through this kind of intermediary, the secondary antibody. And how the secondary antibody is able to do this is because it is going to be able to bind specifically to that primary antibody using that primary antibody's kind of like generic part. So the secondary antibody is going to be raised against the primary antibody. So basically, if your primary antibody was made in a rabbit, your secondary antibody might be made in a goat, and it would be goat anti-rabbit. So basically, they would inject the goat with rabbit antibodies. The goat would make antibodies against the rabbit, um, and then you could then use these goat anti-rabbit antibodies that are attached to, conjugated to, a, um, to something that would allow you to detect it. Because lots of people are going to want these same secondary antibodies, and you can use them with all different primary antibodies, they're going to be a lot cheaper. And because you can have multiple secondary antibodies bind to a single primary antibody, they're going to allow for signal amplification to increase your sensitivity. So multiple reasons for using secondary antibodies, and hope this helped you understand.